struggling too much. So that's where we'll start. Now, if there's any questions about anything as we go along here, be sure to ask. I've been teaching night classes for 40 years this year. And I don't mind going over and over and over and over and over and over things. Many, many times. Tell people, grasp it. So if there's anything that I'm doing that you want a little more information in, you're probably wondering why, in my particular case, I'm bringing this play up as high as it is. Two reasons for me. I can feel any inconsistencies in the play, any hard spots, and also any bubbles, any soft spots. Also, as you get into larger pots, if you don't really compress those bottoms very well, you're going to get S cracks. And so one way of doing that is by pushing the clay up and down a few times. And generally, not always, but generally, that'll take care of it. You see some pots on the table to the left. The first one on my right, closest to you over there, is fired in a gas kiln, and that was about 18 pounds of clay. The one in the middle, was wood fired two days to about cone 12, and that's about 22 pounds of clay. The one on the left is one full bag of clay, wood fired for two and a half days to cone 11, 12. So that's kind of the range I work in mostly because that's the market to sell. I do pots in Japan at our studio that are six and eight feet tall. I mean, as big as a 50 gallon drum or bigger. But that's because over there I have a market for it. And once in a while, somebody here will ask me to make something like that for, for a yard or a large entryway or something like that. And uh, I'll do that. Okay, so we've got. I'm sorry? What kind of clay are you using? I'm using the V clay. V clay. Bravo box. Okay? It's something you all have access to, so. When I do workshops and I travel around, I try to use whatever the most common clay in the area is. And from what I understand, and this is what we use over in our area too. It's a very forgiving clay. Uh, you can make very, very large pieces. You can get into sculpture. You can get just about anything. With Bravo Buff? Bravo Buff. Amazing clay right there, sir. Thank you. Very, very much. Nice. Okay, so what I've done is basically somewhat centered that. And then, many of you have probably used this technique before, but it's kind of very common in Japan. I, I just gave up a studio there. I've been made 33 trips there to study. And this is a pretty common technique that we use because we are still using kick wheels there. And so with a kick wheel, it's really hard to center a big chunk of clay. And when I say kick, I mean you're kicking all the time. You know, it's not just once in a while. So we usually just take a piece of clay like this, put it on top, and just gently work it down. Okay, being careful not to trap any air. So this is about a half a bag of clay. Any questions? Um, you put like a little indent in there before you put that clay in. Right, that good, good eye. That little indent is important in that the bottom of the clay was very rounded, the piece I put on. So it kind of nestles in there for me as I kind of scooch the clay down on it. And it gives me a little better tie-in I found over the years. You can probably get away without it, but uh, when you're studying in Japan, you have to do it the way the potter that showed you how to do it did it. So that's kind of what I've fallen into. What direction are you turning? Here, I'm going in the direction that you Westerners prefer. But you're usually coming in both directions, or? Pardon? What, what do you usually use? I usually throw in this direction in this country. In Japan, we go the other way. No, and so which one do you prefer? You know, yeah, if I'm here, I prefer this way, because it, most people yeah. understand. So you're not going to answer. Yeah, so I, I really don't have a, a favorite. It's just that some of the traditional forms that we throw in the East, almost mandate that you throw in the other direction. Now if you, left-handers here, any left-handers? Okay, left-handers, do not learn how to throw the way most people teach you over here at three o'clock. Learn to throw at six. 
and that doesn't make any difference which way the wheel goes. It's going to work for you. Yeah, just right here. And you'll see, uh, I've had some Japanese potters come over and work with me, and they learned to throw that way so that no matter where they were, it's going to work. Left hand, right hand, wheel. Okay. Any other questions? Just shoot them out there. I'm used to them. Where's your wood fire? Uh, I have a wood fire kiln in Santa Cruz. Oh, okay. And in Japan, I wood fire in Moscow, Japan, and also Bizan. So I have a question. Are you there? Are you there like six months out of the year? And no. I usually go during Golden Week in April and spend the time there. There's a lot of activities that are happening, cultural things in the city. And then I go to Moscow usually for three or four weeks to work in a studio there. And sometimes, uh, over the last 15 years, I've given about maybe, well, about 15 workshops for Westerners in the town of Moscow over the years. Uh, the last one was like two years ago, well, just before the earthquake. Um, so I go there as long as the invitations are extended for me. And then I have a some friends there to set up my schedule. So I usually know about a month before I leave which studios I'm going to work in, where, and how long. Last year I was there just after the earthquake, mostly cleaning grip for about a month. Rubble, clean rubble, help rebuild some kills with some friends of mine. This year I'm taking a break. Okay, so if you can't throw a wheel, throw a beat. So it doesn't have to really be that simple. Yeah, that's not really perfect, is it? Are you guys looking out there? Okay, don't worry about that. You can work on that later. So how do you open that? How do you open up a piece of clay when you get it that big? Yeah, anybody else? One hand, two hands. Two hands. Well, you know, don't do that. <laughs> what you want to do is kind of dry this a little bit. upside down. So if you envision that, the, the top of the base will be right here. On the ground. So I'm going to beat this down pretty much to the back. And I, I really don't care if we get an S-crack here because we're going to cut the uh, piece out of here. But just to show you that in a moment, you can get away with this. left side, opposing the rotation of the wheel with the heel of my hand sponge here in case I need it. So you've gotten the bottom to the thickness you would have gotten had you opened more traditionally? Yeah, if I was throwing a pot upright, yeah. So those three pieces on the table, they are uh, all two pieces? I'm sorry? Those three pieces that are on the table, they are two pieces? No, those are all one piece. One, I'm, and, uh, you throw two pieces Yeah, together. two pieces. Yeah. Put it together. No, those are all one piece. One piece. Yeah, one, one, one bag of clay, 20 pounds, about 16 on that one. Um, but, as one gets older, you have to adapt. <laughs> so, yeah. if they get any bigger than that now, I used to be able to throw 50 pounds of clay in one piece, but now I'm down to 25 pounds, and soon I will be down to this, you know, so I'm practicing. <laughs> okay. 
Questions. How many pounds of clay is there? Well, each ball was six pounds roughly. Okay. Yeah, and there's the other half of it over there. Do you always keep your heating your water? Yeah, and uh, today I really don't need it, right? <laughs> but uh, I live up in the hills over in Santa Cruz behind Carrillo College. And it's usually pretty cold there, uh, and so I like to keep my water. This keeps it kind of lukewarm. It doesn't really heat it very hot, but just so that it feels pleasant. You don't want real hot water because it's a little hard on the joints. But, uh, okay, now I'm going to switch to the other side. Now that I feel everything feels pretty even. And the reason for that left hand is I can put my elbow into my leg and use that for leverage. Here I've got to put my foot on the pedal, right? So I really can't use this leg. So you've got this in here, and so... You you can exert a lot of pressure this way, using the edge of your hand, bringing up a lot of pressure. Now the other reason I like to throw the, I'm, I'm assuming you all have one wheel at home, at least. So by throwing the top upside down, I can take this bat off, set it aside, and then throw the bottom next, and then we're going to flip this over and attach it. But if you throw the top first, then you've got to be sure that you get the, uh, you throw the bottom first, you have to take it off, and then throw the top, you have to be sure that the bat pins line up the same as when you took it off. Because the bat pins aren't in the center of the bat, really, right? So it's going to throw it off, and you have to mess around with that business. I don't have the sponge against the plate. It's just back here in my hand, so if I need it, I can Now, I have eight wheels in my studio, so if I'm throwing large vessels, I'll throw them in a series of usually six. And so I have the pieces turning on the wheel, so I have all the pieces made by noon. And after lunch, on a day like this, I can come back and put the first one together, and by the end of the evening, I have them all put together. And then if I have to do any trimming, I trim them, you know, right side, just take some of the beef out of here. As you get taller and bigger, you have to leave more clay down here, right? So you're going to want to take some of that off later. Uh, a little trick that you can do, uh, you don't want to make it a part of your life. Uh, and I've seen potters put push pins in the bottom of the pot so that if they were making pots they couldn't get their hand back into when they were trimming vertically, you know, with the lid up here, that they could trim until they heard the tick, 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 tick of the pin. And that pin would tell them that's as far as you want to go. The pins are not that bad. Step off, I guess. So. Okay. Well, look at the tools. I make a lot of my tools, as a lot of my friends do, because most of the potters I work with uh, in Japan are quite poor, so a lot of our glazes we gather from minerals that are nearby and make a lot of our tools from scraps of wood and pieces of metal. Which one? A wood fire for the firing process. You know, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, in 1998, I got six people together, 3,000 bucks a piece to build a climbing kiln in Santa Cruz County. We, it was a 10-day fire and I had a Japanese fellow come over to kind of oversee it. It held 2,200 pots. There was 24 of us firing, eight-hour shifts. And we all had pots in there. At the end of the fourth year, everything was great. That's when I left. And the six of us that built the kiln put the money into it left. And left it as a gift to the potters of Santa Cruz County. I don't think it's ever been fired since. Three of us that were in that initial group decided to build just a small kiln so that we could get into the spirituality of what we had learned in Japan and not have a big party. And so there's three of us that fired this kiln twice a year. It's 60 cubic feet, very simple. Easy to fire, we use recycled wood pallets and that kind of thing. Fire. And we do it in the winter twice. Um, 
the uh, I don't want to get too much into the philosophy of Western thinking, but uh, I've visited a few wood fire kilns in California, and it just didn't have the same feel to me. The seriousness, to fire a wood kiln successfully, it has to be very quiet. You have to be able to hear the kiln. The kiln makes a very definite sound, and it changes constantly in relationship to the atmosphere around the kiln, how much wood you're putting in it, how little wood you're putting into it, uh, and every firing is different because the stacking is always different. And it takes, in the kilns I worked at in Bizan, they fire twice a year, and that is the whole income of the family. Usually fired with three or four family members, and it is deathly quiet. And the one that owns the kiln usually sits out front and is watching into the firebox, listening and telling us novices how many sticks to put in, which part of the kiln. It's a very, very personal uh, experience. And until a Westerner, I think, has really experienced that, you really don't get an understanding of what wood fire is really about. Uh, and I did. I went over there because I have experience here. We're going to drink and have some sandwiches and cooking and partying and, you know, what, all this noise going on here was a lot of fun. But it wasn't really what it's about. I used to do a lot of raku, what we call it. I went to Japan 30 years ago. I had the pleasure of going to the Raku Museum in Kyoto and I was invited to a tea ceremony. And then I realized what raku was really about. I've never done it again. Because the whole meaning changed for me. And I realized to really do Raku, I have to study the tea ceremony. Because that's what Raku is about. So, and there's nothing wrong with, I don't think, from foreign, from other cultures, and making it their own. But it kind of loses, I think, you know, lost in translation, you know, something. And I know some people have gone over there and studied wood fire and come back here and started with a very spiritual way of firing. And it kind of degraded because they started inviting their friends and people and, you know, they wanted to share it. And I think there's something very hard to share, you know. And so, now that's my own feeling about it. You guys have all had different experiences. So, anyway, enough of that. Back to you. Okay, the first ones I'd say fairly vertical. Okay, that's where they're strong. Leave them thick. You can always take clay off, right? So putting clay back on is a little bit difficult. Maybe I'll pull this out just a little bit. All I'm doing now is just compressing this clay wall. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that when you're lifting clay, what's happening? It's moving upward, but what's happening internally? Anybody? Well, when you're, when you're, well, no, that's what I'm doing now, but when you're lifting clay, you're separating the clay platelets. Okay? If you look under an electron microscope, clay platelets kind of look like a contact lens, but kind of oval. And they, they slide within each other and out. So, what you want to do, especially on larger pieces and even small pieces, is to rib down. Okay? You're compressing it. And also, uh, when I'm throwing just everyday wear, I always shape from the top down. You know, if I'm doing bowls or cups or whatever. And what that does, especially if you're shaping from the inside, it creates a tension, a surface tension, which holds things together. So if you're making a large bowl, if I took this form and brought it out to here, that would be the diameter of my bowl. But the walls would be straight, okay? The foot would be down here. Then I would hold the top and shape it to the form I wanted very slowly. And that creates a tension on the inside where I get a very, very smooth arc on the inside. A little bit like dynamic symmetry. You're just hanging it together using that arc. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just uh, leave this here like this. I'm going to put a little bevel in it. Okay, and I'm holding it like this so that it flares out a bit. I'm going to 
going to take this off of here. throw plates, if you give these a coat of 40 weight oil, let them set overnight, wipe it off, turn it over, 40 weight oil, <coughs> and you don't like trimming, you can make your plate on here, and when it's ready to dry, it'll pop right off. <laughs> you don't even have to cut it. So that was worth coming, huh? <laughs> well, some of you probably already knew that. Okay, so here's another piece of clay, this half the bag, so the other half. Any other questions, please? Uh, I didn't mean to get on that, that talk there. I tried to stay with myself. So since you're working just now, are you a witch penalty? Yes. <laughs> yes. I always witch. Always witch. You know, Did you wedge your arm today? Yeah. I thought we missed that. Yeah, I can't find anybody that knows how to wedge anything. You do Kikuneri? She wouldn't do it. <laughs> you do the Kikuneri? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, the, and, and the reason uh, you see a lot of that in the, in the Asian country is that, uh, is that the clays are pretty rough there, you know, because we're digging them out of the ground. And, uh, most potters don't have processing equipment like we have here, and so there's a lot of stones and rocks and inequities. Uh, kinds of things so but you know if you can wedge and it doesn't have any air bubbles wh whichever way you're doing it is fine you know? I think that's a very beautiful way to wedge because it looks so pretty you know when you do it and there's a rhythm to it you know so that makes it really nice. Are you referring to the spiral or is it something different? I think so. Okay. Look how percent I'm wedging. This comes out like the Nautilus show? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any questions on that last technique? Anybody have anything? Yeah, okay, I like to really work your body, you know, get your body into this thing. Your body leverage as much as possible. Also, a couple, couple things I'd, I'd like to relate to you is that before every class and before I enter my studio, I meditate. I clear my mind so I'm 100% focused as to what's happening. So I meditated this morning, and I went out to the studio and threw a couple of mugs to make sure things were going to be pretty good today. But it's kind of like warming up. It's a hard thing to get students to do, is to sit down and throw a couple of mugs. And if it goes really well, just then do whatever you're going to do. If it doesn't go well, clean up your studio. <laughs> Mix some blazes, you know. Bring your notebook up today. Those kinds of things. Uh, It'll really uh, make things go better for you and you'll be happier for it. But I find that uh, a few students that I've worked with that have gotten into meditation, I've been able to get them a lot further, a lot faster. Because when they walk into my studio, they don't have all those hassles on their mind that we all have. You know, like taxes. <laughs> so uh, I really believe it's really important. Uh, just like an athlete warms up, or a musician before they really get into whatever they're doing. I think it's really critical. It will make you a better artist, better potter. Uh, even if you don't meditate, just throw that couple of mugs in the morning. And by the end of the week, you'll have 60 mugs. Hopefully with handles on them. <laughs> okay. You want to hand me a couple of things for the Yes, sir. Okay, how many of you seen these before? No. No? I love it when I can show people something they've never seen. These were baseball bats. And you know how expensive a used baseball bat is? It's really expensive. And I had a friend of mine turn these on a lathe. Okay? Now, I, this is not my idea. I have to give Randy Bradnock some uh, credit for that. And if you've never taken a workshop from him, you need to. The guy's amazing. He gave me this idea, and I've had about six of them now, 
and you want them cut so that you can lean them on your shoulder. This is an opening device, by the way. And it fits between your fingers and feels comfortable. I want you all to get up closer. You have to get out of those chairs. Stretch a little bit. So you can see what's happening. Pull the chair forward. Sure, you can pull your chair forward. Right. So I'm going to put a little dent here. You all ready? Mm -hmm. Got your cameras? <laughs> Isn't that neat? Yes. <laughs> now remember, big pots don't have to be perfectly round. So don't get so caught up in making it that it has to be perfectly round. Because you're only going to see one side of it at a time. It's not like looking at a book. <laughs> pushing down, but it's not sliding off your shoulder. You're moving your whole shoulder uh, down. I'm moving my shoulder and my body yeah. down. Yeah, if you kind of watch as I work today, I use as much body leverage and bracing as possible. And also, I take a deep breath before I put any pressure on the plate. And so, also what we do, deep breathing exercises with the meditation, is when you deep breathe, your whole body muscles get tight, and it all works with you. If you look, I'm opening at about 45. Why? Because when I start moving this clay out, I will be moving a little bit of clay into a lot of clay. If I had a straight hole in there, then I'm like this and I'm trying to move that whole mass of clay out. Really critical. Also important when you're doing little things too. If you open up at 45 degrees, your little fingers in there, it's just moving a little clay into a lot of clay. You know, have less movement. Okay. Now, what, one of the things I'm telling you, I didn't invent. I was just working with a lot of fathers in Japan and some fathers in this country that I picked up these things. So, don't be afraid to leave it thick down. Okay? Because it's going to be a plan. Lean back. What I'm going to do. Okay? That's going to be subtle. Now, remember <coughs> that you have to slow down as you come out. If you keep coming at a constant speed, it's going to start fighting you, okay? So I had a lot, a lot of slip in this water when I came over this morning. Make sure I have enough. Now let me tell you, it's just as easy as it looks. Now I'm going to press down gently, firmly though, go right back to the center. Not that little chip off there. Isn't that slick? That's awesome. Yeah. That was, I know what you guys paid how to much, be here. How much, you, <laughs> how much are you selling those baseball bats for? Exactly. You know what? Yeah. You can go in production, George. You know, uh, That's awesome. little that joke. Awesome. Uh, we have Phoenix Ceramics over in Santa Cruz. Kevin Wall runs it. And I go into Kevin about 10 years ago with this little... 45 degree wire cutting device on this beautiful IP wood that this guy gave me. And I said, hey Kevin, I made about 60 of these. Why don't we bag them, put them on the shelf, see if we can get eight, nine dollars for them. He says, just a minute. He goes into the office, comes back, and here's one that has a 30 and a 60 on it from Japan for four bucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So they're coming from Japan, I just know it. Or China or somewhere. But not yet. Now, have you tried it? No, it's really rough. Yeah, okay, I'm going to show you how to throw with that. It's a beautiful clay in a wood fire, and high fire. What you do is you take and get a real heavy slip, bravo buff slip, any slip, very thick. And then you go down to Home Depot and you buy those cotton gloves, the throwaway cotton gloves. This is the way we do it in Japan. Rocky clay down there. Put those gloves on, <coughs> put it down in that slip, and throw. You know, and you'll be able to throw very large pieces. That Grogzilla is amazing stuff. Uh, and it, for garden projects, it's the way to go. I mean, it's a beautiful clay. It reduces nicely in the wood kiln, the gas kiln. And you'll be making things that are just gorgeous. You know, it's amazing. George, what clay do you use for your own work? Now, those are all out of, out of Bravo Bob. They're also Bravo Bob. Right, okay. with a slip on that one where the crackle is. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of red clay and ochre clay in Santa Cruz County. So I just drop it into a uh, blender and then uh, 
and then grind it up and just paint it on pots. And make it use it that. So I'm pushing very hard, okay? To get this in. Clay wants to go where, guys? Out. Out. Yeah, we don't want it to go out. We want to go again. Get in there. Get in there. Okay. Okay. Wrap my thumb around the top just to compress it. Okay. We got my calipers there. Every time you raise it, do you always compress down? Yes, generally. Uh, uh, you'll see me miss it sometimes. Uh, you know, sometimes. I usually can do everything while talking. But I can accommodate six people there. But for large pots, I really need about two wheels per person. So I usually do that over at Santa Cruz High School. They have a beautiful facility there, glazed lab, kilns, everything. Uh, I've been teaching night classes there for about 40 years. And uh, parking, plenty of parking. It's a great, great place to work. Again, the other thing too, how many of you guys throw with your knuckle? Okay, so you're like this, right? Don't do that. Get the thumb out here. Okay, so you get your thumb out there, and you'll be able to lift a lot more clay, a lot more evenly. And you see where that thumb is? You guys look over the top of my hand. You see where that thumb is? See it out there on the left? The left of the knuckle. Very important. Also, leave this a little heavier up here, you know, until you, because you know you're going to pull it out. We need to get it out there to, about there, so that'll thin it out. You're going to your thumb again. Your thumb. Oh, like that. Yeah, you'll, you'll really increase how much clay you're lifting. Just don't dig in. Well, you've got to, you've got to train your thumb here, yeah. you know. You've got to train your thumb. You've got to have a good curve on that thumb. Yeah. A good curve helps. <laughs> you know, so that will increase lifting. And Masami showed me that. Uh, <clears throat> he was watching me struggle. Uh, oh, you missed the bat. No, I can't. I can't put the bat on the bat. You can probably find somebody cheaper than that to turn the bat. Yeah, yeah. These, these are just stainless steel ribs that I made a few years ago. I can get my finger in and really hang on to them and compress the clay. And make, make but I like wooden tools too. There's a cabinet shop in town that saves me the hardwood. So. But once a year I do a, wood, a tool making workshop for a day. And, uh, I make all kinds of tools. I like that metal red with a hole in it. Yeah. Yeah, I was holding my breath in. Any other questions about anything? Remember, bring it out a little at a time because. You know, when it starts getting a little thinner, it's a little harder to uh, push back. A little chip from around the hands. You know, once in a while I get a little piece of wood in this marble block. <laughs> what a big piece. I found that. Have you? Yes. <laughs> it's a nice fry. <laughs> Uh, anybody have a needle handy? I have a needle. Do you have a needle sheet? Thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is put a little heat on this thing while she's getting it. So this part's not very exciting, so if there's any questions, you guys yeah, I know this speeds it up. But good question. I was just going to get to that. Normally, I don't do this in the studio because I'm stressing the clay. And if it's a commission piece, I don't want it to go bad. And normally on a large piece, if somebody, if it's an order, I'll usually make two or three of the same piece to ensure that I have one that's going to come out without any problem. Um, and generally, if they all three come out good, what I'll do is I'll offer the second two pieces at half price to the uh, original. And generally they'll sell. Because in a wood fire, they're all going to come out a little different. And as you know, in a, in a gas fire glaze situation, you know, there's going to be some nuances and some changes, maybe a little warping and you know, that kind of thing. But uh, since we're under a time constraint here, and I'd like to get this together, how are we doing on time? Oh, good. So you know how to spiral day? Great. I've got two bags of clay. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I,
to squash you. Uh, how many of you guys are full-time potters? Good for you. You know, I'll tell you, uh, I went to Japan it's almost 35 years ago. And uh, I'd been working in clay for a while. And I thought I was pretty good. And I, uh, I found out that if you can wedge clay well, that you can find a job in almost any studio in Japan. <laughs> that's true. And, and the thing is, when I say well, I mean not only well, but to be able to have a sense of the clay uh, that you can throw, that you can wedge for the throwers. Mm -hmm. So if you've got one guy throwing cups, he wants his clay with a certain firmness. The guy throwing sake bottles over here wants a certain firmness. The third guy wants something. And so if you're wedging for these guys, and you can get that down, uh, you've got a job. They don't pay you anything, but you get to uh, eat a lot of fish head soup and rice and uh, kind of neat things. Which that slopes in, right? The top? Yeah. Yes. So how should this slope? Yeah. This is slow pain, so this is good to see. I'm going to bend this out a little bit and we'll check it for the diameter and then we'll look. Oh, that's pretty close, huh? Okay, now when putting this together, the weakest part is this rim, mm -hmm. both rims, right? Mm -hmm. And so what it wants to do, would you check that for me and see if it's the same diameter? Sometimes you set those down and what happens? They move. It's quite a bit smaller. Huh? It's quite a bit smaller. That is Which small. is small? That one is fine. Oh, is it? Okay. Go ahead, remeasure it. I'm going to nick the, uh, and I'll move this in. Good. We don't want things too perfect around here. Let me see how far off Oh, that's going to be a challenge. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm not responsible. <laughs> we don't need a challenge. Over. What we're going to do is push that in and then we'll pour it out later. You notice I used a sponge in there because I want to dry this area. I don't want to oh, add any okay, moisture yeah. to it. Things like this just happen, and we kind of show you how you can deal with it. Okay, that works. Why didn't you just uh, make that a uniform shape? Huh? So you pulled this in right now. Mm -hmm. You've got it going like that. Why didn't you just coat it in uniform? For the from from below. Right. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, Would um, you like me to do that? No, I thought maybe, <laughs> no, I thought maybe you had a seat. Not a seat. No, no, no. Take me there. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> oh, I was going to push this whole thing. Which is for out. strength, I guess. Because you were just being be lazy. I understand, George. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking that would be a weak, a weak spot if it were. No, yeah. gonna, it's, it's nice and thick there. So. See, when I pushed it in, it thickened the whole thing up. And it feels, it feels pretty nice. Okay. The angle is the other way, right? The other way around. Mm -hmm. The other way. Oh, right. Good thing somebody's watching. Yeah, thank you. We are I was like, Right. So, what I'm going to do now is just take a little of this. Yeah, magic glue. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You don't score it, George. Do you score it, or you don't score it? Um, uh, usually, I don't score it unless it's pretty dry. You know, if a uh, lunch hour is a little long, but uh, you know, so you guys feel it. Okay. 
Oh, yeah. Got to keep those ribs clean. Really? I never do. And, and uh, lubricate it. You might have to put it in the and dip it in the water. Go ahead and put a little heat there. It's art. Okay? Thank you. 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 Thank Since then, uh, I think you find wooden ones, it's wonderful. It's hard to find wooden wheels in here. And I've got some big wheels, small wheels. The best wheel is, you know those wide plastic wheels? Okay, we're down to 10 folks. Thank you. So under, under beds, you know, they put those wide wheels. Yeah. But they're plastic now. Yeah. If you can find some of the wooden ones, they're marvelous. They're barrel shaped, so they're great for rolling stuff into the clay. But you can take a Dremel tool and cut some beautiful designs in it. And what's nice, because they're barrel shaped, they don't need a line. Yeah. You just leave the pattern, and they're about that wide. It's just hard to come on. I mean, you always, you know, park the flea markets and stuff. I was able to get a couple just recently. I can't believe my luck. I use this here for building up the shoulders, so I'm going to push this out a little bit. I say I'm, I don't use heat normally. I'm working a lot faster. It's not really work. <laughs> so, like if you take the workshop, at the end of the day, you have one piece really well finished and looking good. And we'll be hand building for the hand builders. And we'll be throwing for the throwers. And we may even just Good enough. Uh, <laughs> good enough. That's a nice piece of shabby too. Yeah, there is. Um, you know, my classes, I've so many beacons in the classroom. You know, I'm sitting here. Yeah. 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 people in here? Take something that's used in another yeah. venue yeah. and make it work for you. 